talking about the heart of worship this morning, Malachi chapter 1, but go ahead and turn over to Acts chapter 13. We're going to begin in the New Testament very briefly, and then we will make our way to the last book of the Old Testament as we transition from Habakkuk to the great book of Malachi. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you on this nice, cooler day, fall. It's good to be in Colorado. We are talking about the heart of worship. And so this book, Habakkuk was all about, why, Lord? Why do you, aren't you going to work and intervene and do things? And the Lord told Habakkuk, I am. And Habakkuk went, oh, okay, sorry. And so now I need to worship you. And so now we get to Malachi, and it's all about worshiping God. And so last week we looked at prayer, and this week we are all into Malachi 1 and this concept of worship. And so we're going to get right into it in different ways we can define worship um, and how we look at our both congregational community worship, like this morning, and how we look at worship outside this building during the week as we all independently worship the Lord um, and we all do this, of course, together right now. And so uh, lots of ways to think about worship. Uh, but if you really want to get into it, it's all about your heart. Isaiah 29, 13 is up on the screen. The Lord says, these people come to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. And so that part, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Obviously, in Isaiah's time, there was a struggle between their heart and what they were doing. They were, their lips were singing praises, but they didn't really mean it. Their heart wasn't into it. And God's like, that's not really worship. And this struggle is not new, in other words. The struggle we have of worshiping the Lord and both with our hands and our lips, as well as our heart, uh, is as old as Isaiah and Malachi in the first century and all the way to today. And so that's why we're kind of bringing this up. Malachi, of course, is intent is to help us think about worship. And so we want to do that now. And so when we talk about worship, you know, what comes to mind? How would you define worship? We know it's from the heart, but we also know that it's something we do. So there's a, some externals as we worship the Lord. Chapter 13 of Acts, a great little place here. Another way to talk about worship, or the way I'm going to begin by defining it, is to use an Old Testament definition, and that is worship is ministering to the Lord. Do you ever think about ministering to God? It's like we think about ministering to the homeless or ministering to people who've been in big trouble or ministering to people who don't have any goods or money or whatever it might be. But have you ever thought about ministering to the Lord? That's what worship's all about. Jeremiah 33 spends a whole chapter on it, talking about some of the problems and some of the ways they were ministering to the Lord. But here in Acts 13, here's a way they minister to the Lord. And so chapter 13, they were in Antioch and the church was there and there were prophets and teachers and Barnabas and et cetera, et cetera. And verse two, while they were worshiping, or another way of saying it is the way the text says it in my version, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So during their worship service, while they were ministering to the Lord, Paul and Barnabas were called, set aside, to go and preach the gospel somewhere else. And so it's that another way of talking about the worship service as we minister to the Lord. And that brings up a very important thing. And so I just want to give you a picture of that here in a moment. But just a reminder that worship has been difficult from the get-go. From Genesis 1... Till now, worship is hard sometimes. There's all the things that get in the way of worship. My sin, your sin, our uh, weariness of doing things. The, the, uh, sometimes we do it from our hearts. Sometimes we're doing it with our, right, with our lips only, and we don't really have our hearts there. And sometimes our hearts are in it, but we are doing the wrong externals. And so it's like, you know, it's sincerity in doing it, but, oh, you're not really, you know, right? I could, like, I believe that if I worship the Lord, I need to sell my house and give all the money to the richest man in America, and I'm sincerely believing that's wholehearted worship. Mm, you're, eh, 
God's not really pleased with that. But right? But I may think it's worship. So sometimes our externals are wrong. Sometimes our internals are wrong. And that, 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 that difficulty of worship. And so I'd like to just show in picture form some of the, what I think is one of our serious problems in worship right now, for at least for the last hundred years or so. We've fallen into a trap of thinking, and it's an easy trap to fall into, because what do, I, what do we call this purple area up here? The stage. Very good. And so we typically call this area up here the stage. But of course, in worship, this is not the stage. And so we get it all backwards because we, 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 we start thinking that worship service is like going to a concert or like going to like watching your baseball team play. And so we tend to think of worship like this, that <clears throat> the prompter is God. He is prompting us through his word and the Holy Spirit to worship. And then we have performers, that'd be the song leader, the uh, communion leader, Bruce, or the preacher, myself, and we perform on the stage, and then who's our audience? The congregation. But of course, this is completely wrong, isn't it? That has nothing to do with worship. That's not worship. Worship in the Bible is never addressed like this, ever. It's like, that's completely wrong. If we were going to a baseball game, that'd be great. And after the baseball game, you'd look at your favorite player or football game or whatever it is that's going on right now. I guess they're playing football right now. So you'd say, you know, it's like, you know, my quarterback, uh, hmm, yeah, I watched him and he didn't do so well. He threw for four interceptions and 27 yards total. And it's like, uh, you know, it's like, oh man, that's really a poor performance. And so if we're not careful, we'll see this as the song leader is the performer. I'm not the performer right? What am I? I'm the prompter. I prompt you people to worship out there on your stage. That's all I do. And then I'm done. And I may do a poor job of prompting, but that's your problem about whether or not you perform for your audience. Because you're on the stage. You're all being judged as we speak. Not by me, but by the audience. And the audience decides, hmm, good performance today, guys. Your heart was really in it. Or, oh, man, you're not very good at this, are you? I mean, it's, that's his problem, not my problem. I'm just the prompter. I'm just over here going, you know, and probably the only place I get in trouble is I should use a, like, maybe Devin needs to use a bigger cattle prod. Get to worship it, right? But that's the prompter. You know, prompters do it in different ways. Like we, you know, and so we are over here, and, you know, we have whole entire meetings on this. How do we help people worship God better? Right? How do we prompt them to think about God and to think about what he does and to, and to give their performance to him? And so, you know, at the, end of the, at, the, so at the end of the service, I'll be rating you and telling you your performance. That's just the way it works. That would be the way worship works. You're on the stage. I'm in the prompting booth. And your audience is all around. <laughs> and so that's just that's the way worship is. And so as we go through this process of worshiping the Lord and all of you exist on your particular stage, right now we're in the congregational stage, right? You guys are all out there on your stage, the, the Longmont Church of Christ stage, and as well as those at home. Um, you're part of the stage. And then during the week, you go out and you perform worship. And then God is the audience, right? You're not performing worship out there for the person that you're helping, right? You're doing it because you believe in a, in a God that's all-powerful, et cetera, et cetera. And so this, is, this little thing, though, gets backwards sometimes, doesn't it? Why? Because it's so easy. It's so easy to think of this as the stage, and you guys are the audience because I'm doing all the talking, but really, you're the one doing all the worshiping because I'm just talking. You're actually worshiping. And so... You know, can I be worshiping along with you? Yeah, yeah, kind of. But it's hard for the prompter who's telling you worship, worship, to also turn around and be the guy sitting on the pew worshiping. And so, right, that's primarily this dynamic that takes place. And so helping preachers learn how to worship at the same time they prompt and helping congregations see their role. Because what does this dynamic lead to? 
The reason I'm kind of camped out here for a moment is because this is Malachi in a nutshell. It's like if you want to see a one picture of Malachi, that's it. But secondly, notice how it switches things. If I'm in this view where the prompter is God and the performer is the preacher and the audience is the congregation, how do I come to worship each Sunday? What am I going to get from the performer that God wants me to get? But if I go to this dynamic, what, is the, what do I come to worship with? What is God going to get from me, the performer, as led by the prompters? So the question suddenly becomes, what am, not what am I going to get out of this worship service, what does God get out of this worship service? Because he's the only one that's an audience this morning. He's the only audience member we have. And so he's the only one that should be asking, what did I get out of that worship service this morning? The rest of us should just be going, what are we doing in this worship service for our audience this morning? And so you can see how it changes the dynamic from me-oriented to God-oriented. And so there's that concept of ministry now. Okay, with all of that then, let's talk a little bit about what does this mean for us. So back to Malachi 1 now, starting in verse 11. He says, from the rising of the sun... Even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. There's that foundational verse that underpins our audience, right? They are, he is, his name will be great. And so he is the great one. And so there's this this concept that externals do matter because Malachi goes on to say what? Oh, you guys are like, you like, you offer me the, the lamb that's like blind and doesn't have any value. Why do externals matter? Like how well you sing and how well you worship and how well you do service. Why does that matter? It's all about your heart. Well, it is, but it's about how the outward reveals the inward, right? These externals, they reveal how I see my audience, God. So when I, like, perform poorly in my worship, it really reveals how poorly my heart is, right? It, it tells me where my heart's at. If, if we, we can talk about, well, you know, these things, does it matter if you come a thousand times to worship or only 900 times? No, but it does give you an indication to yourself how well you're, where your heart's at in relationship to your, to your God. And so, so these things kind of go hand in hand, don't they? We know from James 2 that the outward, like, like faith is faith without any need for outward things, but you will know I have faith by my outward things. And so it's just, it's just a proof, it's just a showing of what my, where my faith's at. If I really do love someone, what will I do? Be warm and filled, I love you, or I will act. So that external definitely matters, doesn't it? And so that's that concept of Malachi 1. So here's what I want to do with this. I want to give you two things here of what Malachi teaches and, and this is it. And then we're just going to kind of camp on number two there for a moment. But sacrifice must cost us. That was last week's lesson. And we see it. We remind ourselves again. 2 Samuel 24, 24. That's where David, remember he goes. He wants to buy some property so he can, make, he can give a burnt offering to the Lord. And when the owner of the property finds out, oh, David, you want to buy my property? Oh, you want to do a burnt offering? Hey, I'll kick in an ox for free. Go to town. Have a burnt offering. And David said, I'm not going to take your free ox and burn it to the Lord, it didn't cost me anything. Why would I do that? That's crazy. No, I'm going to pay for my sacrifice. I, it, it has to cost me. Sacrifices that are worth nothing don't mean anything. And so, I don't know. There's, I'm sure there's a million and one modern day examples of that, right? I mean, right? It's like, you know, we all know that's true. We all know the story of the, the widow with her two little coins, right? And so the Lord's watching, and the the widow comes, gives two little coins that aren't worth anything. And he's like, she gave more than that guy over there because he gave out an abundance. It's like there was no sacrifice on his part. It was like, you know, it's no big deal to cash out, you know. He could cash out a few bonds. He's worth millions. Nah, no big deal. And so, so there's this concept of, wow, does it cost me? And we see that. We see that clearly in Malachi with the bad lambs and et cetera. And number two, I've got to guard against becoming weary of worship because that's where he concludes, verse 13. You say about worship, my, how tiresome it's all become. And you disdainfully sniff at it. 
And you bring what was taken by robbery and what is lame or sick, so you bring the offering. Should I receive that from your hand? It's like, is that worship? And so we've got to be careful to guard ourselves against becoming weary of worship. You're watching me on live stream right now? Keep worshiping out there. You're, you're in here this morning, sitting right here? I mean, obviously you've not grown weary of worship. You're performing right now. Great job. Keep it up. And so you're doing a great job. And so you're worshiping. So, but we want to guard against any of us, live stream or here right now, from going, you know, I don't think I need to do this stuff. I don't think it's that important. So I think I'm going to take a break from worship. And it's like, how did I become weary of worship? How do, how do we fall into that trap? And so I think there's some things we can do, many things, to help us not grow weary. And I'm going to offer a couple of things this morning, and you can come up with all your own too. I mean, what keeps you coming every Sunday? What keeps you worshiping? What keeps you sacrificing? What keeps you like working with your hands and helping others during the week and offering worship like that? What keeps you going? So those are great things to share with others. But I'm just going to use a little bit of Hebrews here for the rest of the time we have to kind of remind us, motivate us to not grow weary in this. And so uh, the text is Hebrews 12 and 13, and it goes like this. And so number one, Remember the purpose of worship. I think that's helpful in motivating me to not grow weary, is I keep reminding myself of the purpose of worship. And so it's an interesting concept because worship is a lot like marriage. Marriage and worship go together. How much do you say they go together? Well, it's like this. If you read Hebrews 12, verse 28, it actually says, and we're going to read it together in a minute when we get to it, it's going to be about showing acts of gratitude in your worship. And then by 13, chapter 13, around 14, 15 there, it talks about different ways we worship the Lord, the fruit of our lips or the service of our hands as we share with others. And guess what the Hebrew writer put in between those two bookmarks? You know it. He talked all about marriage. So, so... So the Hebrew writer weaves marriage within his discussion of worship. And as we go through it, if you haven't in your life yet, maybe all of us have done this, but if you haven't, you're going to at the end of this go, but of course, Edward, that, it's like, yeah, that's why the Hebrew writer did that. It makes total sense, right? It's just the way it works. Because think about this for a moment. And I'm going to say marriage or worship, and I'll probably say them at the same time, or I'll say one or the other, but they're both the same thing. So it doesn't matter which one I use. You can use marriage, you can use worship. So I'm just going to go back and forth. I'll kind of flow in between the two for the rest of this lesson. And so it's like, why do we have marriage? Or why do we have worship? So we've already established that worship is us who are performing to our audience, God. Why do we have marriage? Marriage is not primarily to meet my needs, right? That's not what marriage is about. If you believe marriage is going to meet all your needs, at the, and when you get married up here, and I'm like, I pronounce you husband and wife, you may kiss the bride. Oh, bless their little hearts. They both believe that this is going to meet all their needs, and that's what the other person is for. It's like they're going to be what? They're going to grow what? Over time, weary of marriage. Because the other person's not always going to meet all their needs. And they're not able to meet all the other person's needs. And it goes back and forth, right? But see, if it's all about me, then what does it keep becoming? All about me. It's all about my needs. If I keep coming to worship and I think it's all about me, will I be disappointed? Every Sunday. I mean, it's just after a while. You know, at first you're all like, oh, the joy of worship, and we're all singing together on the mountain kumbaya together. And that happens it's, you know, once in a blue moon. But a lot of times it's like, you know, it's snowing outside. Would you rather stay in bed this morning? Right? And so if it's about you, you eventually go, well, I kind of feel like sleeping in today. And you sleep in because it's about you. And so you can see the same thing with marriage. See how that kind of goes hand in hand. Because marriage primarily meant is to, number one reason for the purpose of marriage is to express the relationship that we have as humans with God. The relationship I have with God is just like the relationship a husband and wife has. That's what the, that's what the marriage model is supposed to represent to the world, our relationship with God. Hmm, I wonder what worship's about, right? It's about a relationship with my God. I'm worshiping through this relationship I have with him. But secondly, what do we have marriage for? 
So it's not just a representation of our relationship to God. It's also my opportunity to help another person grow spiritually, whatever ways that might be. Encourage, whatever ways that might be. And suddenly you hear it in worship, don't you? I come to worship because it's also a time to encourage others and to help other people, to help them to grow. So as I worship, I'm doing a couple of things here. I'm expressing my relationship with God, my audience, and I'm also encouraging others to express their relationship with God and to express that both here corporately as a community and then individually during the week. And so how can I encourage and build up someone else? And how do we honor and display this relationship we have with God? So if you really want to think about how to not grow weary in worship, think about this. How do you not grow weary in marriage? What are the secrets? Some of you have been married a long time, right? How did you stay married that long? Right? It's like, you know, this is the opportunity if we had time in the next couple hours, right? I could bring up, you know, some of you old guys. We'd bring Bruce back. How have you been able to live with her all these years? And then we could break her up and go, well, let me tell you, I've been able to live with him all these years, right? And it would be funny, but also it'd be real, right? It'd be like, yeah, that's, that's what it takes. It's like, you have to think about other things besides these selfish reasons, right? And we have to do the same thing with worship. And so, as we consider some of these different things, and so, yeah, that's the worship concept of marriage and worship put together. Now let's go right into the text, Hebrews 12, 28. And we can kind of see this kind of fleshed out here for a moment uh, as we think about these two important things. So it's not about meeting my needs. It's about helping you grow in my relationship with God. And marriage is not about meeting my needs. It's about my relationship with God and her relationship with God and our relationship with each other and that display to the world as well as how we grow together, right? And so this this concept of marriage and worship, it makes sense that when you look in the text, while he spends all that middle ground talking about worship, I mean about marriage here back in Hebrews 12. And so let me turn over there. There we go. So Hebrews 12 verse 28 now. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable worship. And so I think this is second, this is another way we motivate ourselves to practice worship. We remember that worship is an act of gratitude. And when you forget about the gifts you've received and the blessings you've received and all the things that God's given us, then you tend to no longer want to worship Him, right? And so there's this going hand in hand together, this this showing gratitude for all the things God has done. And now I express worship because of that. And so worship, of course, as we move our way through the marriage section and get to Hebrews 13, we get there to the end in verse 15 where he says, Therefore... Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, that give thanks to his name. So there's the bookends now of thanksgiving and thanks to his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices our audience is well pleased. So God's going to, like, talk about his, oh, yeah, that performance was pretty good. And, and I know for sure that the fruit of my lips giving thanks to his name and doing good and sharing with others is well-pleasing to my audience. And so that's what we do when we worship. And so there's that expression of our lips and the end an expression of our hands. And we're doing that in gratitude to God. And so you can hear all kinds of things there, right? How do I keep worship from growing weary? I think of my purpose in worship. I think of my thanksgiving during worship. I think of all the great things God has done for me and how how awesome God is, right? And that's how Malachi concludes the chapter. He talks about, you know, because God is a is a He's the King of Kings. How would we not worship Him? So that's the text in Malachi. I'm gonna give you one more definition just to kind of add to this many faceted thing that we're talking about and i'm going to go back to david now and this one's psalm 34 so here's david's definition of worship out of the psalms psalm 34 verse verse 3 oh magnify the lord with me and let us exalt his name together 
So you can hear David's emphasis on community worship. And so notice the word, that worship is about magnifying the Lord. And, you know, lots of, it's just, wow, worship is the act of magnifying God. Maybe that's another way of saying it. It's enlarging our vision of God. So you know how that works. When we're far away from something, it seems very small. But as we get closer and closer, it gets bigger and bigger. So the closer we draw to God, the larger he becomes. And we need a big God. We have big problems. We have big worries. We have big questions. We have all kinds of things going on in our lives. So I need God to be big. And so the closer we, the bigger we make him, the more we magnify him in worship. The more I come to worship and sing a song like, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the more I can go home and go, wow, God's a big God. And that puts into the proper perspective now my little problems versus this big God. So that's a part of what worship's doing for us. It's magnifying him. And therefore, it magnifies him in our lives. You remember when you were in junior high? Many of you are not going to remember this, but this is such a fond memory. I can still see my junior high science teacher. Oh, I loved him. Oh, it was awesome. It was a great place. Years later, I, a couple of years later, I went to student t- taught there at the same junior high. Hated it, of course, because I knew all these teachers, but <laughs> it was a bad deal. But, so I didn't stay there very long. But... Um, just student teaching, you know, a little subset before I went to the high school and student taught. But, uh, but I love this teacher, this biology teacher. And biology is not as good as chemistry labs, but, you know, biology labs are okay. And in this lab, I can still see them. You get the little glass slide. We had taken the pond water, you know, from the local pond there in Lubbock, Texas. And so you can imagine plenty of stuff in our ponds in Lubbock. <laughs> and squirted it on the slide. We put the slide underneath the microscope. It looked like a little bit of water on a, on a glass slide. And I started looking. And then he came over and looked. And he was like, you got it, Edward. Amoeba. Get that amoeba. Get it. Get the amoeba. And I'm like, where, where? Oh, there it is. And I could see the little amoeba, you know, dancing around in the water. It was so cool. I was so hooked on, like, you know, anything to do with anything, right? I was doing my little microscope stuff. He was jumping around. You got the amoeba. You got the amoeba. It was so fun. And you're like, wow, take the slide out. It's a little smudge of water on a piece of glass, right? So you have to magnify the whole world that exists in water, right? When you magnify it. And then you think, okay, that's the same with God. It's like people in the world, they don't see God anywhere. Why don't they see God? God's just a little bitty. <coughs> He's just not big. He can't even see him. He's like, I don't see God anywhere. Where's God in that? God's not in that. And so we have to magnify God for people. That's a part of what worship's about. And so David, I, I get David's understanding. David's like a little scientist. He's like, we sometimes have to magnify God for people and help them see this big God. And that's what worship's supposed to do. So just like every other aspect of life, Marriage is meant to magnify God to others and draw people closer to God. And worship is meant to magnify God and draw people closer to God. And so on and on it goes. So worship is our response, personal and corporate, to God for who He is and what He's done and His His name. And that should be expressed in how well we do our worship corporately and privately. So my final question for you is, as we continue to think about worship over the next few weeks here in this lesson is, are you giving your best, right? That'd be chapter one of Malachi. Are you giving your best in terms of the cost involved of your sacrifice? Is it costing you something to sacrifice to God? What about, your, what about the quality of what you give God? Are you giving him the first fruits or kind of like, yeah, this is like the corn that really doesn't need to even be, it's not even edible anymore, but I'll give it to him. Number three, are you giving him your priorities? How easy is it to prioritize God into a lower place? Because I've demagnified him. I've like made him small. And what about my personal integrity? I think that's an Acts 5 question. It's like, do I tell him I'm giving him one thing, but I give him something different? Do I tell him I'm giving him the best, but then I only give him like partial part of it? And so some of these questions I think each of us personally have to address. And so I promised I would do this, you know, at the end. "Mm, You guys did pretty well. I give you an A minus. No. (laughs) Right? It's just, isn't that silly though? Because I love it though. Because it's like, 
we'll, we have a tendency to do it. We all do it. We have a tendency to go home and go, well, that's pretty good worship service. You know, the song leader was a little slow or fast or whatever, or the preacher, ah, he did okay, he's this or that and the other. And you're like, wow, you, you missed the whole performers. The performers were you. You can look at each other and decide how well you did. And you can look at your own heart and decide how well you've honored your audience this morning. And that's your obligation and responsibility. And I'll keep, well, I probably wouldn't use cattle prod, but, but wouldn't that be cool when mornings show up, big cattle prod, get to worshiping. Anyway, no, that wouldn't be cool. All right, thanks for being here this morning. You guys are worshiping the Lord. And what, a, what better place to be than right here doing it, our live streaming with us this morning, all together worshiping Him and not being weary of doing this every week. Let's stand and sing.